Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Ella Motem, and today, with the help of our tuning expert Johannes Keller, Hi. we'll give an overview of temperaments. In past episodes, we discussed some advanced issues concerning tuning and temperaments. However, since we believe that this subject is important, we thought that it might be useful for some of you that we start from the beginning, go through the very basics, and give an historical and technical overview of this subject. Let's start. Temperament. What is a temperament? A temperament is the system that dictates the relationships between pitches, or in other words, defines the exact sizes of all the intervals in a system. Nowadays, we commonly use 12 pitches in each octave, and those are equally divided throughout the octave. Between each of the pitches, a semitone is formed, and all of these semitones are equal in size. This temperament is the one that is commonly used nowadays which we call equal temperament. Traditionally, temperaments are defined by the quality of the fifths in the system, how much each fifth is tempered, adjusted from being physically pure. Check the glossary on our footnote page to read what it means for an interval to be physically pure. Often, temperaments are represented in circles in which the quality of each fifth is indicated. In the case of equal temperament, each fifth must be tempered and become slightly smaller than pure. The reason is that if we build a temperament based solely on pure untempered fifths, after a sequence of 12 fifths, mysteriously we won't finish on the same note we started on, the circle won't close. For example, if we start from C and then go up 11 pure fifths, We'll end up with a B-sharp, which is not at all equivalent to our initial C. It is higher by an interval called the Pythagorean comma. Here is where we started, and here we landed. This might seem a bit weird, as it would be nice to believe that nature obeys the circle of fifths, but this is not the case, and we have to deal with it. Let us return to equal temperament. The way it deals with this defect is by dividing this additional little interval of a comma between all the fifths, so that each fifth is smaller by a twelfth of it. We end up with fifths that are a bit impure, but what about the other intervals? After the fifths, the major thirds are next in importance when discussing temperaments, and in this case they are also impure. In fact, they are more impure than the fifths are impure. When compared to pure major thirds, the equal temperament thirds are much larger. Let's listen to a pure major third. And now to an equal temperament third, just as it is tuned on your piano. Notice. We are referring to pure versus impure just because it is something to hang on to. Pure intervals can be recognized on the spot by human ears, while impure ones can only be measured exactly with the help of machines. Pure is not necessarily better or more noble than impure. All music ever created by humans mainly consists of impure intervals. So. Equal temperament consists of tempered impure fifths, and major thirds that are even more impure. And there is nothing wrong about that. It's important to note that equal temperament is not a modern invention. Throughout the history of tuning and temperaments, it was known and in some cases used. However, while in historical periods it coexisted along with more common temperaments, in modern times it became more or less the one and only temperament. Now, let's see what kind of temperaments, fifths and thirds, were used in the medieval and renaissance periods. Generally, 
no temperament or tuning has survived from older times. We can only learn about temperaments from textual descriptions, but the connection between those to actual practice can only be assumed. Having said that, it seems that until roughly the 15th century, the medieval period if you wish, the common way to tune was using the so-called Pythagorean tuning. This is in fact merely a tuning and not a temperament, as nothing is tempered. It is built from a sequence of pure fifths in which its two ends never meet. One was not aiming for a closed circle, and certainly not one of specifically 12 pitches, as early instruments often had fewer than 12 pitches per octave. With time, when 12 pitches per octave became common, the two ends of the tuning were sometimes placed on G sharp and E flat, two notes that were not meant to be played together. In later theories, this extremely impure, excessively large interval was called the wolf. It doesn't matter that it doesn't sound good. It's like a hidden dark place in your house that is not meant to be seen by anyone. The rest of the fifths are all pure, which is great, but this is not the whole picture. The resulting major thirds are very much larger than pure major thirds. In fact, since they are so different from pure major thirds, instead of referring to the Pythagorean major thirds as thirds, in some sources they are called a diatonus, a double tone. To compare, here is a pure major third. And here is a Pythagorean major third, a diatonus. The semitones in this system are not at all equal. There are big semitones and small semitones. In comparison to equal temperament, the mi notes, the sharps, are slightly higher. And the fa notes, the flats, are slightly lower. The tuning can be seen in connection with the conventions according to which certain music was composed. For example, the openings and endings of pieces in this period only ever used octaves and fifths, intervals that are purely tuned in this tuning. But in cadences, major thirds and sixths, which are highly impure in this tuning, were used. It might be that the impurely tuned intervals were used in cadences to create tension, towards the purely tuned intervals and by this create resolution. In this excerpt from a piece by Johannes Ciconia, there is a typical cadence of this nature, which can be found also in countless other pieces from the 14th and 15th centuries. Many thanks to Corina Marti and her organetto. There are even sources that suggest that one may raise such cadential minutes even more to increase the tension. This concept breaks the rigidity of a given system and reminds us that tuning, especially in these periods, might have been extraordinarily intricate, and that the general focus on keyboard instruments with fixed pitches is only a small part of the whole picture. If we jump forward to the middle of the 16th century, to the height of the so-called Renaissance period, we find that both the music and the tuning system have undergone great change. The temperaments that seem to be most prominent according to the sources of the period are what we nowadays call mintone temperaments. It allows us to get closer to the utopian idea of having all the consonant intervals pure in a polyphonic setting. This is of course not possible, but can be approximated by compromising the purity of the fifths, which in turn leads to purer thirds. In its extreme form, quarter comma mintone, the thirds are absolutely pure, and the fifths are very much not so. For comparison, this is how a pure fifth sounds. And this is the quarter comma mintone fifths, which is smaller by a quarter of a syntonic comma. 
In other variants of mintone, such as 6 comma mintone for example, the thirds are slightly wider than pure, and the fifths are slightly less tempered, but the same concept of favoring the thirds is kept. The thirds are now considered sweet, according to the sources, and are not creating tension. Accordingly, and as opposed to compositions in the medieval period, pieces now can start with thirds in the harmony, and at endings, a major thirds is obligatory, regardless of whether the piece is in a major or a minor mode. Also here, the semitones are not at all equal. In comparison to the equal temperament, the mi notes, the sharps, are now significantly lower. And the fa notes, the flats, are significantly higher. Notice, mid-tone temperaments, both in theory and in practice, include more than only 12 pitches per octave. When we do use mean tone on a 12 keys per octave instrument, we just use a subset of a bigger arsenal of pitches. And just as in Pythagorean tuning, we put the wolf where we think it would do the least harm. As opposed to equal temperament, we choose the same pitch for different notes, the so-called enharmonics. In mean tone, every note has its own pitch. In other words, E flat, for example, is not the same pitch as D sharp. Here is how E flat sounds in a quarter comma minton temperament. And here is how D sharp sounds. E flat, D sharp. It is true that most of the music did not employ more than 12 pitches. Some even employed fewer than 12 pitches. The number 12 was not important. However, the large number of notes of the Minton system were always there, and many distinguished composers, as well as instrument builders, experimented and included such pitches in their work and instruments. Notice, many non-keyboard instruments include some of these pitches inherently. A last important point about Renaissance temperaments. In instruments that use frets, such as lutes and viols, curiously, the most common temperament used was equal temperament, or something close to it. For this reason, there are several sources that explain in detail why plucked instruments cannot play together with keyboard instruments. But then, of course, there are also other sources that claim that they in fact did play together. In reality, in different circumstances, either the keyboard or the plucked instruments were compromised in some way. And surely, a lot of music making was, then as today, a little bit out of tune. The curious change from Pythagorean tuning to Minton tuning didn't happen overnight. It took place during the 15th century. To this day, musicologists and musicians are not sure how it happened. And for many repertoires, it is not at all clear what the most appropriate tuning system might be. Now, let's jump yet another century forward, and look at the next big change in concept that took place sometime in the middle of the 17th century, from mintone temperaments to irregular temperaments. In an episode dedicated to the late 17th century anonymous treatise Regole di Canto Figurato Contrappunto da Compagnare, we quoted its writer claiming that every sharp can serve as the flat of another note. For example, the sharp of C serves as the flat of D. This, in addition to the fact that in his treatise and in many other sources from that period, we find music in keys that demand many unusual accidentals, suggests that it was not possible to use mintone tuning anymore. It seems that they used temperaments of only 12 pitches, that tolerated the use of different notes with the same pitches. These include the equal temperament, that was discussed and in use by some in the 17th and 18th centuries, but more importantly, the so-called irregular temperaments, or well-tempered temperaments, 
that seem to have been more common. In irregular temperaments, as opposed to equal temperament, some intervals, and by extension some tonalities, will sound nice, with purer intervals and other intervals and tonalities will sound less nice. For example, in Francesco Valotti's temperament, which is probably one of the most commonly used temperaments for baroque performance nowadays, the white keys, from F to B, are tuned in 6 comma min tone, but the rest of the fifths are tuned purely, as in Pythagorean tuning. This means that the chord C major, for example, is as nice as it is in 6 comma min tone. But that B major is as tense as it is in Pythagorean tuning. In equal temperament, this is not the case. All the intervals are equally tempered, and thus all the tonalities sound, well, equal. Some musicologists believe that they know the temperament Bach used. Whether this is true or not, we cannot say. But the thing about irregular temperaments is that it doesn't matter how much you try, there is no such thing as the perfect temperament that would make everything you play sound nice. There is always a payoff somewhere. We believe that musicians tuned according to their taste and intuition, and probably didn't try to recreate any specific temperament they read about in a book. If, for example, a B major sonata were to be played, it is most probable that the harpsichordist wouldn't have tuned his instrument with Valotti, but would instead have created a temperament that would be more forgiving for such a key. At the same time, the fact that it was not possible for everything to be tuned nicely was sometimes used as an expressive device. Especially expressive pieces were composed in remote keys, which were most often on the dark side of temperaments, that is, more bitterly tuned. Thus, the irregularities of the temperaments, for better and for worse, were exploited artistically by composers. Wait, didn't Bach invent equal temperament? And wasn't this why he composed his 24 preludes and fugues in all the keys? Nope. Oh, so it wasn't equal temperament. But didn't he invent the irregular temperaments? And isn't this why he called his famous collection the well-tempered clavier? Also no. Temperaments that were referred to as well-tempered were there before Bach was born. Okay, good to know. Also good to know that any 12 pitches temperaments, be they equal or irregular, were mainly relevant for keyboard instruments. Singers and instrumentalists other than keyboard players were not limited in that sense, and took advantage of their flexible intonation. Yes, but this is a completely different subject that we will have to deal with at some other time, please. Sure. So for now, let's just finish our historical overview on temperaments with its final chapter, Equal Temperament. As we said, equal temperament was there throughout the history of music, both in theory and in practice. Until the 17th century, it was used mainly on fretted instruments, but then it became a legitimate option also for keyboard instruments, along with the variety of irregular temperaments. During the 18th century, there were more and more voices advocating equal temperament with different arguments. For example, Marpo wrote in 1776 that the composer must obtain the character of his piece the building up of an emotion and the strength of expression from sources quite other than the creative powers of the tuning hammer. In other words, he says that with everyone tuning however they like, composers cannot control how their pieces will sound. In the 19th century, there was a clear preference for equal temperament, and it slowly became the one tuning everyone agreed on and strived for. However, and this is true for the entire history of equal temperament. Without tuning machines, it is in fact very hard to tune 12 fifths that are each smaller than pure by exactly a twelfth of a comma. So even if people strived and wished for equal temperament, or perhaps believed that they tuned in equal temperament, it was probably only in the 20th century that equal temperament became truly equal. 
This was a very brief overview on the subject of temperaments. Very, very brief. We hope you enjoyed it. On the footnote page, there is a glossary with all the important terms and descriptions of important temperaments, so make sure to check it out. If you enjoy early music sources, consider supporting it on Patreon. Comment, share and like. See you next time at earlymusicsources.com.